We can get this to work. I need to power those on.
So for our brewery for Cricket Stave, I want to have a year-round beer that's a 100% Britannomyces beers. What is a Britannomyces beer? I mean, if I want to brew an IPA or a Scottish ale or a porter, we have a preconceived notion of what these beers are like. But what is a Britannomyces beer? The first thing I often hear is, oh, they're sour. But Britannomyces is yeast. It doesn't create acidity. When it's used in an anaerobic, um, in, in anaerobic fermentation, the way we would use you know, Saccharomyces, negligible amounts of organic acids produced. So it's not a sour beer at all. In fact, it actually creates quite delicate beers. So the idea was to set out and see, is, is this a beer that people want to drink year-round? Is this a yeast that people like? Is it just novel? If you produce one of them, everyone wants it. But as soon as you produce two, it's boring. You know, you move on to something else. And so the idea was playing off the color wheel, being able to use different ingredients in these beers and see what people liked, maybe what people didn't like, and just see if these beers are just a fad or if there's something people are really, really interested in. So that was a big part of it. On top of that, I mean, very, very passionate about uh, traditional brewing. Uh, Lambic, I hold to the highest regard, and Saison in many ways is, is very, very similar to Lambic. There's just a couple of differences in it. I'll get into those that I talk about other beers. Uh, so Petite Sour, uh, Surette, Batch number one, so that really fancy one with the red wax, it's very hard to get off. Uh, that was actually the first first beer we uh, brewed, or I brewed for Crooked Stave. So January 10th, 2011, 100% Britannomyces fermentation, 100% uh, in oak. So out of the kettle. Um, it was a really kind of fun event as we're filling it up. We use a bulldog to fill barrels, just as kind of stainless steel tube that comes through, and you've got a valve on it. So filling one up as it gets up to the top, you've got to yell back to someone else, like, turn the pump off, turn the pump off. And then, okay, back on, back on. And just doing this over and over and over again, a whole six times. But it was, it was quite <laughs> immense still. Uh, it's a very big batch for us. So, uh, and it was fun. We let it age 15 months. Uh, eventually, then added raspberries to it and released it. So that first batch took uh, a good amount of time. And we still have, I think, batch two, I don't even know. There's there's multiple batches still. This first couple that's still not been released yet. They're still aging and souring, uh, and they need to be released by now. So m moving forward from that first year, saw some of the saisons that we started to brew. Uh, what you guys have now actually is Surrett. As you can see, Surrett's gotten a little bit of a makeover. So that's the brand new label for Surrett as we go to release it the next time. Uh, Surrett's really fun. It's a saison. It's a provision saison which is basically the equivalent of saying like a stock or an old saison and it's beer that was held surret actually mean in french means tart and i found in the the farmhouse ales book the one written by phil markowski there's a bit in there by yvonne de beats and he talks about um in the footnotes way in the back i guess it wouldn't really be footnotes but uh, in one of the regions they called saison when it had been aged a long time and started to become tart they called it surret so instead of calling this beer Saison, we called it Surette. And we released this a little over a year ago now. And so it's gotten that time to build up that little bit of acidity, to build up that Britannomyces character. Very, very traditionally brewed, spent time aging in oak. And that's how Saisons are. Saisons, when they were originally brewed, when they were originally brewed, when um, historically as they were brewed, everything was in oak. I mean, lagers, everything back in the day. We didn't have stainless steel, we didn't have even iron that there was pre-World War I, people were burning into, it was oak. So Britannomyces is a beer, Saison is a beer that always had a Britannomyces characteristic. The difference is really between Saison and Lambic is that Saison was using fresh hops from the Popering area. They both actually used quite a lot of hops. Saison was very, very bitter. Uh, Van de Beet says that some of the first Saisons, when they were first brewed, uh, were undrinkable. They needed to age six months just to bring that character down. So they used so much hops to try and stop that bacterial infection. It's not any different than what we consider, you know, an IPA in England, except for the yeast that they were using was different that characteristics. So, so a saison's got more hop, more character, fresh hops, and they used the culture whereas lambic was spontaneously produced. A lot of saison brewers actually purchased lambic and blended in. Saison was always kind of a blend of uh, young beer, which was meant like six to eight months old, and older beer, 18 months and older, they blend. They then often dry hop, really, really common to dry hop. 
they call it reliving old beer. And so the two saisons that we're doing, uh, the saison vila artisanal, which means old artisanal, is a classical saison, and the serrette's kind of provision saison. So two very big passions, being able to take the botanomyces, take everything we've learned about it, and be able to apply it to try and brew what are a very authentic you know, 19th century saisons. And because of it, we've, we've recently got the, we now have four fooders, but we have the three big ones that have just come in. And that allows us to really kind of keep a secondary culture, always aging with botanomyces. Um, that actually doesn't have any bacteria in those. I blend in smaller amounts of more acidic beer. So really same and traditional to the way that a saison was done. Moving through, but continuing with the theme, uh, as, as we released the Lawrence and Botanomyces beers, we saw a lot of a lot of interesting comments, a lot of great feedback, and so it's great. Um, I guess my my background in, in doing research and liking academics, I like being able to see you know what people think, what they do about it. So a lot of these beers were experiments that the the consumers, the friends, the interested drinkers got to participate in, and kind of bringing that in, hearing about it, seeing which ones they like. There were two that that really really seemed to people jive with. One was Wild Wild Red Orange, and that's becoming St. Breda. And the other was Hop Savant. Go figure, people like hops. Yay! Yeah. 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 Uh, a very fun beer, the Hop Savant. So, 100% Britannomyces, with a strain that is, is quite clean. I wish I had something to be able to show off, because it's, it's very different from this one in many ways, because the Britannomyces doesn't show through for months, but the hops are so present. So much aroma, so much flavor. Very new way of, of thinking about IPAs, where take the bitterness out, but instead it's all aroma and flavor. So we're boiling for 90 minutes before we add any hops. And we don't add any hops until kettle off, whirlpool in, and then just start dumping it in. Um, I'm trying to think. Four pounds per barrel, so what would that be? About, what, about eight ounces? Yeah, about a pound in, in five gallons or so, somewhere in there, give or take. So. It's a, a waste of hops, probably. But that's <laughs> uh, kind of like kind of like how it tastes, so I'll, I'll stick with it. Um, St. Bread, on the other hand, really really interesting. This brings out some of these really really subtle nuances of Britannomyces, and as I get into it, I'll talk a little bit more about the flavor production. Uh, you could almost consider it a take on like a Belgian white. Uh, it's not so much the coriander, but a little bit of the citrus we use. The citrus really kind of complements that characteristic. Again, just another way of thinking about these beers. The Britannomyces beers that we brew are actually really clean, really neutral, uh, very, very delicate beers. So something that you know, wine drinkers and people who are you know, less akin to some more aggressive beers are actually fall really into these. But on the other hand, it's, it's Britannomyces wild beer. So it's, it's very fun to, to kind of turn people's heads. It's all about you know, the experience. You as home brewers, when you're brewing these beers, you want to share it with your friends. That's an enjoyment, that's a time when you're having an experience, you know, you're able to talk about the beer, and it's the same thing, you're thinking about you know, ways to increase that experience, ways to you know, think about it a little bit differently. And then Nightmare on Red, this one's just kind of a, a fun play, uh, I guess more or less on Nightmare on Elm Street, but I've, I've got a friend who's actually a, a brewer in Colorado, and after he drinks these Brett beers sometimes, he says that, uh, you know, he's, he'll wake up in the guest bedroom, or he'll wake up in his bed, but with the pillows from the guest bedroom, or <laughs> talks in his sleep, or sleepwalk, so kind of poking fun at him, calling this nightmare on bread, so it's, it's basically a big Baltic Porter that we do. I, I love Baltic Porters, I think they're absolutely delicious. So to put the kind of crooked stay spin on it, is one her separate Tanomyces, so this big, dark Baltic Porter, and then we always age it in whatever barrels we get, so um, we've got some rum barrels actually coming in from Jamaica right now, and some other uh, a small Colorado producer, some barrels from them that I'm really excited about putting in. So just playing around with it, doing spirit barrel age stuff, but still very in the, in the crooked state fashion with uh, Britannomyces. Uh, the last aspect, the kind of the last, but in my opinion, the really most important aspect that kind of makes up our our production as we move from saisons to wonders of Britannomyces beers is into what I consider American sours. So we've got a, a golden sour, which is a one percent Britannomyces primary fermentation, then soured with lactobacillus and PDO, and from that we can really create a lot of blends with fruit and different things. 
a burgundy sour. Um, not that much different than a Flemish red, but actually very different. Very, very lactic forward, very low acetic acid. And uh, another dark sour, which again, it, it's really the reason why the Nightmare on Bread exists, is to recycle these bourbon barrels all the way through to where you're just getting the nuances of vanilla, but in a big Baltic, uh, Baltic style sort of port that's been soured. So that really makes up our portfolio. Um, yes, I have an obsession with Botanomyces, and it's in every single one of those beers. Um, just a little, but, but some. So, brewing with Botanomyces. Um, it, it's something that's become, I would say, extremely popular. You're seeing it, you're seeing it at GVF. You're seeing it in the categories. You're seeing it in the beers that are being released, the beers that people are talking about. And it's because it's a really fun time for it. Just the same way IPAs were, some of these other beers. There's a lot of different styles of beers, a lot going on. And Britannomyces is, is one of the ones that I see. It, it's very artistic, it's very creative driven. When I went to, to do the research, uh, I can't exactly, I can't explain why. I think drinking sour beer when I was 20 years old kind of warped my brain and uh, slowly became obsessed with these. So I blame New Belgium, it's probably their fault. But, so, Botanomyces, it's an organism with a lot of historical significance. As I talked about earlier, you know, all beers were, were in oak. Everything was in oak. That's the only way we had to store things. And the using stainless steel uh, in brewing, in storage, and, and other materials is, is relatively new within the past hundred or so years. Stainless steel might even be less than that, actually. So the historical significance of this yeast is extremely important because it was in everything. It was a signature of all beers. You know, yeast, and, and knowing the fact that yeast even ferments beers, 150 years or so before that is, you know, is sticks that we use. And if your stick was sick, you went over to your neighbors and re-inoculated it in their beer and came back over. And, and that's what it was. I didn't know about yeast, we didn't know about these organisms. So Retanomyces is something that is, was always there and now it's died really in a way. Only now are we seeing this resurgence. You know, very few breweries were still using it um, on purpose, at least. So England's one of the ones who, um, well, they should be so lucky to have Retanomyces in their beer, but it was named after them. And so uh, I wanted to know more about this yeast. I knew that there were a couple of brewers who were using it. I was able to talk to them. And it, it kept growing and growing, more people were using it. But no one really knows how it's fermenting, why it's doing what it's doing. A look at literature would say that it's not really possible. So I wanted to go back and investigate that and see why. So uh, I show the, the Burt Union system because that's one of the, the few systems that still runs, that still uses oak for the fermentation. And if you see these, I mean, it's very obvious why they get infections. You have a big trough just running along the top. And so as it kind of foams up and over, it goes in that trough, just runs down the center, and gets recycled right back in. So just everything from the air being able to come into it. English brewers, I mean, the, the term Britannomyces means British brewing fungus. And so it seemed um, fitting being in Edinburgh and, and studying this and then wanting nothing to do with it. From there, the idea really while well, studying this was like, let's continue to increase the knowledge, let's continue to spread this. And so the Britannomyces project is what I started. And the idea was to to do open, uh, open source research to allow people to read about it, participate in it, and hopefully encourage more people to continue to use this yeast. And that's a great way to be able to find more strains, get more people interested, and also just be able to, to communicate and, and really push the knowledge on it. So, as I get into the more technical aspects oh, wow. of, of Britannomyces, um, sometimes you see Britannomyces or Decora, uh, geneticists love to really mess things up, and so they've come up with this. Decora is a sexual reproducing form. Britannomyces is the uh, the anamorph, which in brewing, when when you're propagating yeast, you're always concerned really with the asexual form. So it buds, it creates a daughter cell, and continues to replicate. So you have a single organism throughout your entire fermentation. Britannomyces is the same thing. So I really consider it proper to use Britannomyces and not Decora. But a lot gets used with the name, and a lot of people talk about uh, Brett C and Brett L and Brett B. And as I think that's going to become a lot harder because 
as there continues to be more strains and more strains, you know, there's going to be more Brett B's, more Brett L's, more Brett C's. And the way to think about those is, is they're really just names. Uh, again, blame geneticists, but they've gone back and really there's no such thing as Botanomyces lambicus anymore. That is Bruxoensis. But you can probably assume that lambicus came out of a lambic beer, so you know, its characteristic is different than the Bruxoensis. The way to think about that is, though, is that you know, Saccharomyces cerevisiae is what every single ale strain we use. So if you use that California ale strain, or you use that Belgian Trappist strain, all those are Saccharomyces cerevisiae. It's just they're different strains, different types. It's the same kind of way when the yeast labs use um, Brett B or Brett L. They're all just Bruxoensis. And the same thing actually for Clausinia. Clausinia uh, was an old name. Clausin, I'll get to here in a second, was a researcher who uh, first actually named Tamaisis. Uh, but there's land geneticists, no such thing as Clausinia, it's an anomalous. But when you say Brett C, you know, everyone knows what you mean. It's the equivalent of saying you had a Scottish ale strain instead of saying Saccharomyces cerevisiae. To be more specific with it. Uh, they're quite neat. There's some pictures from the research shows the different size and different character of them. It's a little bit different than the round cells you're used to seeing. So initial characterization, again, Tanoises is, while it was something that was always around, very, very new. Um, Clausin wrote about it. I say the research, the research was published in 1904. Uh, that's actually a little take from a, a patent. So a smart guy decided to do a patent before he ever published his research. Um, but that didn't work out very well for him. Um, so yeah, it was, it was interesting. I mean, he named it British Maroon Fungus, so Britannomyces, uh, a very fitting name, really interesting. It was 35 years later before another research came back and looked at Britannomyces for the next time, or at least that's what publications say. And so Custers, who that's where everything kind of that we continue to, to pass on and we continue to spread about Britannomyces, which a lot of it's actually mistruths, um, comes from that research that Custers did. At the time, the Associated just coming from England and Belgium. Uh, as we now know, there is absolutely nothing Belgian about Britannomyces. It's found in California, it's found here in Tennessee. Every major wine growing region in the world has Britannomyces infections. Uh, so it's interesting. I, I still hear sometimes, like, oh yeah, the Belgian yeast. No, it's Californian, or um, I have Britannomyces from Croatian wine from all over the place. Um, the Australians are some of the ones who do the most research, so I assume they're probably some of the ones with the most, uh, most infections, so a lot of retinoises there. From Custer's thesis, this is where a lot of the information that we, that we I, I continue to hear pass on, we really continue to see. So one of the big things is people always talk about, yeah, retinoises make sour beer. No, it creates like the aromas and the flavors that you find in sour beer, but it produces very negligible amounts of acetic acid. Only if you hook up your air stone and are pumping oxygen into the wart are you going to get a lot, a lot of oxygen. And by that I mean continuous air stone running for days. Are you going to get any acetic acid production and other organic acids? But Custer's research looked at botanomyces in small sort of dishes under what we would consider non-brewing, um, kind of a non-brewing set of standards. So he wasn't, he didn't take warp, he didn't you know, pitch a set amount and look at how its fermentation was. Instead, he took them from plates and was just monitoring oxygen uptake and CO2 uptake. Well, in that short amount of time over a period of hour, what he saw was botanomyces was more active when there was oxygen and less active under anaerobic conditions. Well, I mean, when you guys do homebrew batches and you pitch your saccharomyces, you don't really see any activity for about 12 hours. There's stuff going on, but it's not really blowing off. It's not going crazy. Um, it's the exact same thing with Britannomyces, albeit a little bit longer. So in Custer's research, that part was really rampant by growing scientists for a long time. They continue to say, oh, it's not possible to ferment with this yeast. All it does is produce acetic acid. But they're taking research that had absolutely nothing to do with brewing and trying to apply it to it. In Custer's research, I have a couple of things here uh, where he said, Considerable amounts of acetic acid were produced during aerobic conditions, but no appreciable amounts were formed during anaerobic conditions. Well, when we brew, we're brewing under anaerobic conditions. So acetic acid shouldn't even be something we're really thinking about, because it's not the conditions we brew under. The other thing that he talked about was, he believes cells slowly became adapted 
and we're able to ferment anaerobically, just like Saccharomyces. Um, but for some reason, none of that was ever spread. So it's always been this, this organism that couldn't ferment real well, couldn't do well, just infected your beers. It's, it's, it's interesting, kind of going back and looking at it. So everyone railed Custer's effect. There was a little bit more research done. And Custer's effect uh, became introduced instead of negative Pasteur effect. So Pasteur effect is exactly what we see in Saccharomyces. You pitch the yeast, it consumes a little bit of the oxygen, goes into an anaerobic phase, and ferments, and ferments well into completion. So negative Pasteur effect would be the exact opposite. As the researchers continued with it, they started to call it Custer's effect, since Custer's was the first one to investigate it. And this is where <clears throat> the, the details of botanomyces kind of gets very specific in its character and why it kind of acts the way it does. Beer always helps to throw the best. Amen. <laughs> um, so Custer's effect, that's really small. Oh, well, I'll just read it to you up here and it should make it easier. Uh, the way you look at it is uh, glycolytic activity. So glycolysis. The sugars, maltose, and these other products that are in the wort, they're broken down into glucose. Glucose is what can then uh, be brought through the metabolic pathway to, to uh, turn into alcohol during fermentation as it goes through. It's energy, it's cell reproduction, it's everything that keeps the cell going through its metabolism. During the process of glycolysis to pyruvate, and eventually uh, through the enzymes like alcohol dehydrogenase, where you're actually producing then alcohol, you have to take acetyl-CoA and turn it into alcohol, you have a redox balance that usually has to get re-oxidized. Re so you have NADH, which turns into NAD+, as you produce the alcohol during the metabolic pathway. Well, Britannomyces, in some of the strains, appears to be missing glycerol 3 phosphatase, I believe. It's an enzyme that's able to take the NAD+, convert it back to NADH. Interestingly enough, during that process, usually that redox balance reoccurs through the production of glycerol. Glycerol, in two grams per liter or so in there, is mouthfeel. So if you, we're often looking at beer, when you drink a beer that's flat, completely still, it lacks texture, it lacks a lot of character, that's why beer is carbonated. But wine, on the other hand, is always flat, and it doesn't. Wine has so much mouthfeel. The Saccharomyces strains that are used in wine produce a lot of glycerol. If you think about some of the strains, like uh, there's a French Saison strain, the 3711, that strain produces so much mouthfeel that even though it ferments bone dry, you drink the beers and you have incredible mouthfeel. So one of the things that people talk about a lot with Britannomyces beers is, well, because they get so dry, they don't have mouthfeel. I, I really don't feel that's the opinion. And through looking at the research, through looking at the fermentation and seeing which strains are able to and which ones have the ability to, it's not. It's the production of glycerol. So it's something that, you know, it's not something we can just look at at home, hey, how much glycerol is our Britannomyces strain producing? But it's something that's very important as we move forward in choosing strains. So you see strains that are more flabby and some that are less flabby. But as we go on, there's actually more ways to kind of counterbalance that and make up for that visceral. But that's sort of the counterintuitive system that it sort of works under. It's not able to always do fermentation as well, and glycerol happens to be a lot lower. Uh, a little bit more, some of the things that make botanomyces kind of unique over the saccharomyces strains that we normally use. Uh, two enzymes, alpha glucosidase is the enzyme that uh, has the ability to, to continue to uh, uh, attenuate. So in looking at the alpha glucosidase that Botanomyces is producing, this is an enzyme that it produces at Saccharomyces, at least the brewer Saccharomyces cervicea that we're using, doesn't have the ability to do. It's a two enzyme system, intracellular, extracellular, and it's actually able to break down large dextrins. So for anyone who knows a little bit about like Maltose and um, maltotriose. Maltotriose would be three glucoses. Maltose is two glucoses. Tanomyces is capable of cleaving off something that has up to nine glucoses stuck together. So we would normally call these dextrins. The other one is beta glucosidase. This is one that for me is really interesting because this is the enzyme that allows Tanomyces to ferment lactose. Sugar that we normally would add into a milk stout, we'd say it can't ferment, Saccharomyces can't ferment. 
but also it's able to cleave other bonds and create new flavors for the Nova synthesis. So in hops, in spices, in fruit, there are these uh, glycosidic bonds and it's able to cleave these and create brand new flavors. So it's something that is able to create novel flavors and new characteristics, characteristics that we don't see out of hops. So the idea is you had hops for Tanomyces beer and say you had Amarillo and Simcoe. You get that really big sort of character. A couple months later, all of a sudden it's changed. Uh, we, we did a, played around with this a little bit when I bring it Odell's, and we did exactly that. We brewed a really big barley wine, extremely hoppy. Um, we called it, I forgot what kind of barley wine. It wasn't a barley wine, basically it was like a triple IPA. Just really huge, really multi, a lot of hops. In the lab, we spiked it with some different Tanomyces strains. About three months later, it went from being an Amarillo and Simcoe Blanc to being lavender and lime zest. Those are the things that this enzyme, the beta fluosidase, when it's present, can really play around with. And it's interesting because that's a different aspect. We don't think of brewing an IPA and you know saying, hey, I can't wait to drink this in three months when it tastes different. Instead, it's like, I'm going to drink this now because in three months, it's going to be oxidized and not taste nearly as good. So these are the things that, with using Britannomyces, can really change the beers you're brewing, can change the way you think about brewing, and are just unique and fun. Flavor and aroma, always the biggest. Uh, historically, Britannomyces, you know, funky, barnyard, leather, horse blanket. Um, I'm sure you guys could throw some out, some about a wet dog in a telephone Yo. booth or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, those all sound horrible to me. <laughs> uh, okay, you know, leather and musty and earthy. Okay, acceptable. But the idea is to not have those characteristics. My idea is to not have those characteristics in the beer. Yeah, and in some subtle levels, they add complexity. They can even add some fruitiness, some of those phenolics. But at the same time, they're off putting. And the idea with beer is not to be off putting, but to actually create creative beers. And so for me, that's about strain selection. It's about looking at the way that you're using Britannomyces strains and really brewing so that you're accentuating the esters. Britannomyces does also produce really beautiful esters, uh, sort of citrusy characteristics, even tropical fruit from time to time. And this serret shows off a little bit of all of that. Um, as we get a little bit more into brewing, brewing techniques, way of brewing, acid rest, stuff like that. Uh, I did do an acid rest on the serret. So it has a little bit of that, you know, smoky, which goes a little bit kind of deeper in the beer. And yeah, it was okay. But more importantly is the more kind of citrusy, um, orangey characteristics. And that's a real characteristic one of the strains that we use. I like that. I like to accentuate that much more citrus type characteristic. The big one, as we were talking about, was volatile phenolics. I think one of the reasons why this gets talked about so much it's because so much of the research that's been done was all done in the wine industry. So everything was looking at the negative aspects of Britannomyces, never the positive aspects. Well, you know, beer is very different from wine. For starters, we don't ferment grapes, we ferment malt. So therefore, it's two very different raw materials. Well, malt happens to not have a lot of anthocyanidins. Um, these are hydroxycinnamic acids. These are the compounds that are the color compounds in grapes. There's, there's small amounts, and with some rest, you can break some of those out. These are the characteristics that can create the, <clears throat> the smoky, the clove. Uh, so for these phenolic authors, Britannomyces is capable of producing these and taking them further. But based on how you brew, it's also possible to not have them present at all. So this slide talks a little bit about the precursors and how it forms. And one of the things that is important about this is you know, if you are first making a saison or a German hefty vice, and you're going to use Britannomyces afterwards, that German hefty vice and the way you brew that is going to have the first precursor for this, which is the 4 vinyl guaiacol or 4 vinyl phenol. That's fine because those yeasts and some Belgian yeasts are able to have a POF gene, it's called phenolic valve flavor. Um, strangely, it's called phenolic valve flavor when that clothes the characteristic that we're looking for in the beer. So it's not really not flavor, but perception. Uh, Britannomyces, on the other hand, is capable of taking that 4-vinyl and creating it into a 4-ethyl compound. The 4-ethyl compounds are much more characteristic. So when you're looking at this, let's go back. 
maybe. When you're looking up here at the top one, it's, it talks more about some of the characteristics. So where you have maybe some plastic and some smoke, as they really increase, it becomes more band-aid, uh, more burnt characteristics. And the problem with these compounds is that they're synergistic. So as they come together, you get more characteristic than is actually present. And so they can become very off-putting very quickly. Ester production. As I said, this is what I like to concentrate on more. One of the things that the Tanoix does it does so well, and the reason why we associate it so much with sour beers, is that an ester is ethyl alcohol and an acid, carboxylic acid. Carboxylic acids often are organic acids, so acetic acid, lactic acid, <coughs> other fatty acids as well. When these become esters, they become really, really unique flavors. These tropical fruit characteristics, green apple characteristics. And these are the characteristics for me that I'm, I'm looking for in the beers, and I think are much more appreciable. This next slide is a slide that's taken from the research that I did. And two of the big compounds on here to look at, um, when we're looking at the thresholds, ethyl acetate in very low amounts is actually fruity. Um, as some people know from some sour beers, when you start to get that nail polish character, that's when ethyl acetate's very high. So it's a character that is not that appreciable in higher amounts, but in low amounts, okay. But the big ones are these ones, is ethyl caprolate and ethyl caprolate. So these fatty acids, it's an organic acid, it's produced naturally by the botanomyces, is then able to be esterified. These compounds are, are not present in Saccharomyces beers. But if you look, let's see if I get this to come up. If you look over here and you're looking at the volumes that are present for ethyl caprolate, these are four or five times higher than threshold and present in any other beers. So it's neat because as I was looking at the research, this is the first time that these compounds have ever been seen in beer this high, and it's very characteristic of Tanoix's beers. Looking at the flavors, you know, these fatty acid esters go on to become fruity pineapple esters. These are the, the characteristics that I believe we want present in the beers. It's, it's what we shoot for at, at Crooked State, is making a beer that's approachable, appreciable, has tropical fruits that are <coughs> new esters in a different way, not barnyard, um, wet blanket, these things that don't sound the most appreciable. I'll, I'll say, you know, in certain amounts, like bunk is really, really nice, but when it becomes barnyard like, kind of cross the line a little bit. So, brewing with Britannomyces. Okay, so how does all of that stuff that is um, boring, uh, how do we take all that and really make it appreciable? How do you make better beer at home? You know, how can we make better beer for the day? So on here, I'm, my, uh, I now have more than one employee. For the longest time, it was just two of us, I'm a, I'm a graphic designer. And they like to take pictures of me in random places on my phone. So this one was, this was cool, and the top one was hanging out uh, in the barrel cellar on the top of a ladder, responding to emails. So now I have a, an office with a computer uh, that I try to get on. Uh, the best one actually is, um, at Home Depot, I can't remember what we were doing recently. Oh yeah, we were looking at ladders. And so I set up a really, really tall ladder and wanted to see how high I could get. So I'm at the top of the ladder, you know, seeing it, and I get a phone call from our suppliers. So I'm on top there, up at Home Depot, yeah, yeah, talking on the phone. Next thing I know, I see Travis just like, taking photos of me, putting on Facebook, I'm like, oh, no, don't do that. <laughs> at the very top, testing out how it is. So it's become kind of a running thing, like, you know, where's Chad gonna be on his phone next? I swear it's always business emails. Uh, so, first and foremost, fermentation. So, looking at the different types of fermentation, uh, I tend to talk a lot more about primary fermentation with Britannomyces because that's what my research concentrated on, and that's what I see to be a very novel way of using it. Also, very subtle, very complex, very delicate. But talking about hybrid mixed fermentation, secondary fermentation, bottle conditioning. Uh, very important aspect, raw materials and brewing techniques. So how, when I'm, when I'm setting out to brew beer, and this is for any kind of beer really, uh, the way we're looking at doing this is what I call deconstructing a beer. So, you know, and I, I think it makes perfect sense, you're really, you're taking the beer, and this one for instance, you know, you envision it, you see it, so what kind of head do you see on it? What color is the beer? You know, how does it smell? How does it taste? And from there, you're working backwards. You know all the different ways that you're going to get those. You know, 
okay, if it's this color, I'm going to use these molds. You know, if this is the flavor I'm looking for, these are the characteristics I want to use. If this is, you know, the head retention, and then looking at, you know, how does it smell, how does it taste, and those are the different ways that I kind of think about it. And then from there, you're looking, okay, well, how are we going to use the seeds? So, you know, do I want a clean Britannomyces characteristic? I'm going to go for primer. You know, do I want a little bit more rustic, a little bit more earthy Britannomyces characteristic? You know, we're looking at secondary. And so those are kind of the ways that I go about starting. When I'm first brainstorming a beer, when I'm starting to think about it, from there I end up usually going and doing a little bit more research. You know, what do I know about this type of beer? You know, what do I want to get out of it? And we really kind of stick to those. You know, what other beers have we brewed before? Okay, how do we incorporate those into the beers that we're currently about to brew? So, always a fun little one, quality control. Um, I don't even have a lab at my brewery, but I used to have one. It was a lot of fun. Hopefully we'll have another one. Um, brewers get really, really paranoid about botanomyces. And I mean, I guess I understand that you really don't want to ruin maybe your pale ale with it. But the truth is, is when you're using different strains of saccharomyces as well, the same thing's going to happen. <clears throat> if you're using, uh, the best one that I'd love to use is, is the French Saison strain. If you're using the French Saison strain and you use that bucket or you use that fermenter and you don't clean it well enough and you produce a lager or an ale, that, that 3711 is a really strong yeast and even in small amounts, it will create flavor in that ale, it'll be an off flavor. So if you're able to clean that out enough to where that's gone, the same thing happens with Britannomyces. Yeah, albeit it's an awesome organism, it does love to stick around. Um, you can culture the five strains out of that bottle still a year later because they like to hang out, but it dies just like Saccharomyces dies. So if you're capable of cleaning your heavy bison yeast out when you want to go to brew a, a lager or you want to go to brew a California ale strain, it's totally capable then of being able to clean the Saccharomyces out and you're able to take care of that. So I wouldn't, I don't put so much emphasis in needing to have all secondary products. The things that are harder to clean are sometimes some of the porous stuff. So for us, this is kind of things like hoses, anything that it can touch that can be kind of porous. But again, um, heat kills all. So if you can, if you're in the practice of, you know, getting your, your kettle and, and heating it up and sticking some of your equipment in there, that, that kills Britannomyces. So the chances of cross-contamination infection are a lot less, but as long as you have, you know, great, great cleaning skills, I guess. Um, most people can attest that uh, brewers are really just over glorified janitors, right? We're on the same page. Yeah. I mean, brewings. Yeah. So, here's to janitors. Uh, propagation. So, it's, it's very important. Uh, Botanomyces, I know, for instance, in the lab, I do not store Botanomyces cold. What I was seeing is, during my research, I'd store it cold, five, six months later, it'd be dead. And it didn't make any sense to me. I was like, wait a minute. I can take a bottle that's 25 years old and I can culture botanomyces out of it. I put it in the fridge for a couple of months and it dies. This doesn't make any sense at all. Why am I storing these in the fridge? So I tend to not store them in the fridge. Um, but I'm the only person who does that. The yeast companies, your own brew store, they all keep them in the fridge. And, and for a good reason, because that's how we're supposed to always keep yeast. So I'd be a proponent of not keeping it in the fridge, keeping it out. And one of the reasons why is, when you take Britannomyces out of the fridge, if it is still alive, it really, really is sluggish, extremely sluggish, sluggish. So when you go to pitch it into a fermentation, you know, so you take the smack pack, you take uh, little five gallon vials, they're really going to be slow unless you propagate them up. So I would really, really recommend getting the Britannomyces acclimated, getting it ready to go into fermentation. Uh, I, would, I would recommend this for all yeast, but you know, some, sometimes it's harder, it requires a little bit more equipment. But if you can, you know, if you can pull off a couple of gallons of wort, you can get it going in a, uh, it doesn't even need to be really on a stir plate, you can get it going in uh, an Erlenmeyer flask and you know, swirl it every once in a while. So you'll really have a much cleaner, much better fermentation because that yeast is ready to go into fermentation. So with propagation, it can be done the same way you're doing your Saccharomyces, except for give it more time. So on this slide shows the growth curves. And if you look at the time there, going out 200, well, really, really about 90, 192 hours, you're starting to see the yeast hit the cell phase where it's into basically the, the beginning of lag phase. This is when the physiology of the yeast is just right to go into fermentation. And this is nerdy fermentation stuff. 
but it'll help your rotations. So 192 hours, that's like seven days. With Saccharomyces, two, three days is plenty to go through that whole thing. So when working with Potanomyces, you know, give it a little bit more time. Give it more time in that early minor class. Let it be, let it grow up and let it get healthy. Also though, this is kind of interesting. This, the curves, this is a, a dioxic curve. Very different than the way Saccharomyces grows. If you've ever seen like in a textbook, Saccharomyces grows with this nice sort of bell curve in how it grows. Potanomyces is quite different actually. What it's showing is different metabolic shifts as it's starting to acclimate to a new sugar. So it takes up that sucrose, takes up that glucose, takes up some maltose. It takes a little bit of time. It takes the time to get acclimated. And for me, this is even more reason to get that yeast as healthy as possible before you pitch in fermentation. A little bit more about primary fermentation, clean fermentation, sour fermentation. So <clears throat> again, we're talking about deconstructing the beer. You know, what kind of Britannomyces beer are you looking at brewing? What kind of beer in general are you looking at brewing? Uh, I kind of break it down into two really types of fermentations. Uh, clean fermentation and sour type fermentation. So some brewers like to pitch a certain amount of acidulated malts or do a sour mash or create a beer that's going to be a little bit more tart. Britannomyces really, really likes the acids. It stays a little more subtle on the flavors. But in doing this, you're really increasing the attenuation rate in the fermentation. So it speeds it up, gets it going. On the other hand, you know, if you're looking for the clean fermentation, you're looking at no acidulated malt, no sour mash. And the characteristics here are going to be a little bit different because those tart, sort of sour characteristics that you can get from the sour mash really aid in mouthfeel and character. Um, primary fermentations, again, my big thing with Britannomyces, with fermenting with Britannomyces, is to treat it as much like Saccharomyces as possible. That's a set of, of principles, a set of standards that we're used to. So the more you can do something that you're used to, the more familiar you're going you're to be being able to brew with these yeasts, and the more cleaner beer you're going to be able to produce. I think one of the things that I always hear about with people in Britannomyces is, is their fear for inoculating the whole system and just having Britannomyces everywhere and not being able to produce clean beers. Um, I don't think it's something you really need to be worried about. Clean well, uh, heat is your best friend. A lot of the brewing equipment, except for better bottles, do not put hot water in a better bottle. If anybody has done that, it kind of warps it. Yeah, I did too. Um, I'm, I'm used to using stainless steel, so. Uh, so yeah, don't do that. Glass, I think you're okay. Just be careful about that. But, but silicone and different parts like that for your hoses, hot water is awesome. It's your best friend. Um, so that's the big one, and the other big one is you know keeping it simple, uh, not trying to complement, so uh, not trying to uh, make things so complicated. So for primary fermentation, I'm knocking out at about 68 degrees Fahrenheit, letting it rise up to about 72. I don't see any reason why you wouldn't let it try and rise higher, 74, 76. Uh, Tano ice is very interesting in a lot of the fermentations. It's not a very vigorous, very active fermentation. It actually kind of hangs out down at the bottom, creates kind of a layer of foam across the top, but it's not a big crowd, and it doesn't really create a mess. It, it's really interesting. It's almost like, you know, are you doing anything in there? What's happening? You're kind of scared, like, oh man, this yeast just crapped out, and it's not going to do anything. But give it some time, it does, ferments. You know, primary fermentations are usually 10 to 12 days. It's not bad. That's the primary part of the fermentation. There still is a couple more days, months, that kind of continues to, to keep going. Um, some of the first beers, for, for me it's really been like, taking this Britannomyces strength, okay, how can we apply this to standard brewing? How can we make this practical? So, lager fermentations, you know, from brew to bottle, you're looking at 28 days, somewhere right there. And so in the beginning, I was really, really pumped to, okay, let's get these out. You know, I saw fermentation go from, uh, anywhere from 1048 beer to a 1060 beer down to about 1012 in 10 to 12 days. So awesome, 1012. I mean, that's if you're brewing a 1060 IPA down to 1012, cool, you've hit it, you're good to go. That much attenuation, you're already at about 78% attenuation there. So like, cool, we can bottle these now. We force carbonated them because, and it's kind of funny the way I thought about it, was, I was like, I don't want to bottle condition these for the reason that. You know, I don't want to add another step into the process. I want people to be able to have beers the way it is, 
and by complicating it and bottle conditioning these, now we have the chance of them being overcarbonated or undercarbonated. That's completely the wrong way of thinking about it, by the way. Uh, with bottle conditioning, you can put exactly the amount of carbonation in the beer that you want. It's not going to overcarbonate, it's not going to undercarbonate. As long as you take your, you do your calculation right, you measure it out and do it. Instead, I was like, you know, I will do it 99% of everyone else does, and I'll bring these up to carbonation. Like them to be highly carbonated. Like them to be highly carbonated, and then they'll be great. Yep. Well, then the beer went from 10 12 down to about 10 4. <laughs> and it was highly carbonated. So, and we're in Colorado where it's a high altitude, so beers just love to gush anyways. They love to just come out. So, um, learning curves, learning curves, they're fun. So now, you know, 8 or 12 later, I could say, we got it. And you do that by bottle conditioning. Uh, so that's actually worked out really well. It, it, it was a new thing, though, in doing the bottle conditioning. I'm probably jumping a little bit ahead of myself here. I should stick more on the primary fermentation. But it's, it's one thing to look at. In the retail Lyces beers, you're going to get 78% attenuation pretty quickly, as long as you have healthy pitch. But you're eventually going to get to around 90% attenuation. Always. Um, I was talking to someone earlier tonight, they're like, yeah, you know, I've got a beer. Um, yep, it's been at 10.08. And I was like, when was the last time you checked it? They're like, yeah, it's six months ago. I was like, yeah, it's, it's definitely lower now. That's what it does. No activity, you see nothing coming off. You can hard bung them, but it does. It just keeps going, it keeps going slowly. And so that's one of the, the trickier things. You can account for that, though. You can account for it in bottle conditioning by bottle conditioning lower and knowing that you're still going to keep going that much further, bring it into calculation. Um, or you can just keep letting it go. One of the one of the funnest things about doing the Wild Wild Red series and releasing these beers is when we release them, we're so proud. Oh my God, this is amazing. Look at these flavors. We've never tasted anything like this before. And then six months later, I'm like, oh, this beer is so much better. And you have to correct yourself because you're like, but but when I released it, it was good too. I mean, it it, it was great then. Now it's just better. It, it's it's one of the funnest things because that's just it's not the way it normally works in brewing. It's like drink my fresh, drink my fresh, drink my beer now, drink it fresh, have it. It's great. It's only going to get worse. And that's the idea in, in 